All right, good afternoon, everybody. Here with Josh and Paul and Deirdre. Uh, tell you a little bit about where we are in COVID. First of all, thank you for your good wishes regarding um, fixing up my hip. Um, I thought if I ran 20 miles a week for the last 40 years, it would keep me forever young, but my hip had another idea. But uh, I think we're really here to talk about vaccinations. But thank you for your thoughts. I'm feeling uh, just fine. Um, we have the daily summary up here. Um, what can I tell you? I can tell you the numbers are bouncing around a little bit. Uh, you maybe remember we had a, a positivity rate of over 10% just a couple days ago. Now we're down at 4.37%. Look at the seven day average, that's about 7%. So relatively steady, trending up a little bit, uh, lower than most of our neighbors, lower than the national average. Um, I, I'm having a hard time coming up with a rhyme or reason for how these numbers uh, bounce around. Um, early on, I, I thought it was all about density and high density urban centers. We were part of the New York City Metro Center. That's when we got hit. And, you know, then eight months later, it was North Dakota and South Dakota, where not that many people live. So maybe that wasn't it. Then I thought it was about, um, you know, cold weather driving people indoors. Um, now I see that uh, Arizona and South Car uh, California, Southern California are sort of two of our great hotspots right now. So uh, rather than try and rationalize, what we do know is outside is safer than inside. And there's nothing more important than wearing the mask. And uh, by the way, vaccines are on the way. So. Connecticut continues to have a pretty fast start in getting people vaccinated. Uh, number five nationally in terms of number of people vaccinated uh, per capita. That's about 5% of our population has gotten that first vaccine by the end of today, I think. Uh, pretty good. Um, HHS, Health and Human Services, uh, gave a shout out to West Virginia and Connecticut. Gave us 50,000 extra doses. That's about one week extra dosage. Um, you know, makes a difference. We appreciate uh, people are recognizing the incredible hard work of our um, providers to make sure you get vaccinated and folks stepping up and doing this in an appropriate way. CDC and our allocation committee have come to um, broad conclusions about folks who um, are going to be in what they call 1B because um, people in 1A, you can see um, some of them are beginning to get their second doses. Um, it'll probably take uh, few weeks before all the people in 1A get their second dose. But that doesn't mean we're not beginning to do people in 1B, you know, really focused right now on those 75 and above. The crowd in 1B has gotten uh, much larger. I'll talk about that in a minute. All that means there's a longer line for you to be able to get the vaccine. So we have to be very careful as we allocate that vaccine over the course of the next, uh, you know, three, four months as we as we catch up with the supply and demand. So who is in the 1B population? It was uh, 75 and above. CDC and our allocation committee have now said it's going to be 65 and older. Unless you have a um, comorbidity, a high risk condition, and there, you know, uh, 18 to 65 are now included. Um, so we've expanded the pool by, we've almost doubled the number of folks who are um, eligible for the vaccine. We haven't doubled the number of vaccines. We just have to be more careful about allocation, along with our frontline essential workers and residents of the congregate um, facilities. And um, it's worth noting that we have sort of 1.4 million people in total in our um, universe of 1B, about 50,000 of them are related to those in the congregate facilities. And uh, we'll be prioritizing them over the next a couple of weeks. Number one are those 75 and over. They're the only ones who can now go forward and schedule appointments. How do you schedule appointments? Three ways that you can register. Don't just show up. That doesn't work. None of this Florida stuff. Um, you need to um, get registered. You need to make an appointment. And you can, A, either be contacted by your provider, B, do it online or C, telephone. Let me tell you about each of those three ways to register. All right, direct with the provider. Uh, many of you have had some relationship with um, your uh, health care provider, the hospitals, um, um, health centers and as such. They will uh, reach out to you. Uh, they will contact you, let you uh, get in the queue to make sure you're 75 and over and eligible for a vaccine. 
and um, you're going to hear more and more from them as the H, as the one A group winds down over the next couple of weeks. People in uh, 75 and older can start making those appointments uh, today. Next up, the second way to register is online. Uh, you know, um, ct.gov covid vaccine ct.gov slash covid vaccine there'll be a simple form to fill out that says um you know who you are and your age um don't do this for other people do this for yourself and get that um registered then you'll be uh, contacted to sign up for an appointment on our online vans site which we can tell you about um in more detail but again you have to log into a VAMS in order to get your vaccine. You'll get that information once you've registered at ct.gov COVID vaccine. And finally, for those of you who um, find uh, the internet just a little bit intimidating, uh, don't have access, don't have um, an iPad, uh, there is an opportunity to um, sign up by telephone. Look, a lot of people are signing up right now, so um, you've got to be incredibly patient there. Um, we can't possibly staff everything. And don't call up unless you're calling for yourself and you're over 75. Don't call up unless you're calling for yourself and you're over 75. Uh, but 877-918-2224, 877-918-2224, 75 and over, you can sign up and we'll make sure that you can get that appointment. It won't be overnight, it won't be immediate. You're gonna to have to be patient. But uh, after the group 1A, those 75 and over are now beginning to take appointments. Uh, look, with that, let me just um, uh, be prepared to take your questions and uh, give the tough ones to uh, Deirdre and Josh and Paul. NBC Connecticut. Good afternoon, Governor. Glad to hear you're doing well. Uh, regarding the 1.3 million residents that'll soon be eligible for the vaccine, you know, you mentioned we're only getting about 46,000 first doses a week. My rough math says that's going to take about seven months to get 1B vaccinated. I mean, do you, I know that you expect the number of 46,000 to increase soon, but how soon and by how much? Well, I'll start with that. Um, two things. Um, you're right, 1.3 million. We'll see how many of them actually want to take the vaccine. Obviously, we're encouraging those people to take the vaccine. We are finding that um, older people are much more likely to sign up and want to get the vaccine. Uh, sometimes uh, the nurses and some of the other essential workers are taking a little more time. As you know, we're going to get an extra dose of 50,000. Johnson & Johnson, we hope, is going to be rolling out in the uh, near future, say within the next six weeks or so. That could be a single dose vaccine that could greatly increase uh, our allocation. As you've probably heard the transition from Trump to Biden um, task force, are thinking about releasing some of the second doses earlier. Um, so let's, let's wait and see, but there are some chances we can speed up that timeline you just mentioned. And it, uh, is phase 1B just becoming a little bit too big, a little too wieldy, given that it's almost half the state's population, uh, since it could be weeks or months? Uh, I mean, is there a need to tamp down expectations that you schedule for a vaccine and it could end up taking a month to get that? Yes, I'm afraid that's true. Um, it's, um, you know, close to half the state. And um, and we got to make sure that uh, we prioritize people. And we're starting out for those 75 and above. And so then I imagine for the general population, they should consider that they would be moving a little bit further back as well than what may have originally be expected. Yeah, Deirdre, do you want to talk a little bit about your allocation strategy beyond the 75 and above? Sure. And, um, and you're bringing up a very good point, which is that, that this allocation strategy is limited by the number of doses that we have available. Um, as the governor said, we're hoping for more vaccine as new vaccinations uh, products get approved and as potentially the existing um, manufacturers are able to ramp up production. But uh, we, we can only give out as many vaccines as we have doses. So um, our, our uh, message to the public today is please be patient. Um, it will take time for us to get to the other members of phase 1B. We're starting with 75 and above. Um, but it will take time to get to the rest of the, the people 
in that category that the governor described. In terms of when the general population can uh, expect vaccine, we've been saying all along that that would be around early summer. This doesn't change that all that much. We've, we've moved some people from the 1C category into 1B. The general population timeline we expect is still the summertime and, and aiming to have, if, if all goes well, aiming to have um, good population coverage by the fall. And then my last question, Governor, um, how many guardsmen will be called up and which Connecticut facilities will they be stationed at? If you can give that and any a message to those thinking about protesting over the next several days? Uh, yeah, I'll start and then hand that over to Paul. But um, as you know, uh, we're sending about 100 guard down to Washington, D.C., given um, a lot of the warnings we're seeing online. Washington's going to be a lot better prepared than they were last Wednesday. Uh, we are prepared. Uh, we're prepared with our guard, the municipal police, the capital police, um, and we're going to be very clear to people, um, you know, stay safe, stay home. We don't want protesters coming out right now. We certainly don't want people counter demonstrations coming. Uh, we don't want people rubbernecking, just coming out to see what's happening. Um, this is a very edgy time uh, between now through uh, the, the um, inaugural. So uh, urge people to be careful, but we're ready. Paul, anything to add on that? Oh, the only thing that I would add, uh, Governor, at this time, we won't go into specific numbers uh, as it deals with uh, any activation of uh, the National Guard, uh, but General Ivan, upon the governor's direction, has stated that uh, the National Guard stands ready to support uh, the Connecticut State Police in addition to supporting uh, the Connecticut uh, State Capitol Police uh, as needed. Thank you so much. I can only add that uh, the legislature, I think, is not going to be in session next week. Uh, state employees are going to uh, telecommute wherever they can just to bring down the density of people in and around the Capitol. News 12, Connecticut. Hi, Governor. Good to see that you're doing well with your hip surgery. Uh, First of all, um, we've heard about issues with the phone numbers or the websites in other states trying to register people for vaccines. Have we had any issues so far with people running into hiccups? Josh and Deirdre, do you want that? Um, I can start. Uh, we know that the phone number the governor showed has seen um, high volume today. There's an option uh, when you call that phone number, there's an option that you can pick that says, um, I'll, I'll hang up, but keep my place in line and you'll get a call back. Um, we, we may not get all those calls back made today, but, uh, but we are stepping up even more on that phone line. So people should expect to get a call in the coming days. Um, I tried a couple of websites this morning from healthcare providers, they were busy. I had to hit refresh a couple of times. So we know that there's a lot of volume. I, I just encourage people, um, if, you're, if you're bumping into those kinds of technical glitches, to just uh, try back in a couple of hours. And uh, as we said, patience is the watchword for the day. Um, there'll be, there'll be um, enough vaccine eventually, and we just um, ask that you, uh, that you be patient. And, and, uh, and Deidre, we know that um, 75 and older goes first in phase 1B, but there are a lot of other groups in there you know, teachers, uh, waste workers, uh, et cetera. Do you have any idea what order those folks might expect to go in? So I, I can uh, say two things about that, and that is the, the direction that um, ACIP used in making their allocation recommendations and also what the governor heard from our allocation subcommittee here, and that is to look at the risk of uh, severe illness and death from COVID, and to um, be explicit about issues of equity and health disparities. So as we roll out this next phase, those are the two considerations we'll be using um, as we roll out. And, um, uh, you know, it's going to take time. And finally, Paul and Josh, do you have uh, any indication that protests might pop up uh, over the next few days? Any specific intelligence that people ought to know about? I think the one thing that we'll say is continuously, as we said, uh, based upon the information that's been received, uh, the state of Connecticut um, and all elements will stand ready uh, for any activities that will look to happen, not only uh, on the
this weekend, uh, but through the inauguration. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. I guess, Governor, just uh, one question for me today. You know, for the health conditions for 1B, is there any way that they're going to be vetted? Like, can people who just really want the vaccine claim that, hey, I'm a smoker and get the vaccine? Uh, no, we're going to be pretty strict on that. First off is 75. You've um, got to attest that this is your age. Um, usually people lie about their age and pretend they're younger than they are. Uh, not in this case. Uh, you're going to have to show that you're 75 and above. And we got to be pretty strict about this, um, or else you could have what you see in other states with just a, a big first come, first serve type of thing. Um, we want to keep people, you know, as I've said before, not in line, but online and getting people by appointment only. But I mean, when it comes to some of those conditions that may be more of like on the honor system, how will that be better? Josh, uh, any thoughts on that? This is a uh, folks with a pre existing condition. Is that a Doctor's order, how do you do that? Idria, you wanna take that one? Yeah, so um, we are working through uh, with our um, uh, provider partners, the most efficient way to do this. Um, but to the governor's point, there likely will be some verification needed about the condition. The limited number of conditions um, that the CDC has identified will be starting with those. And it's likely we will need some sort of verification, whether it's an order or um, a, other communication from a provider for those individuals to be eligible. More to come on that. And we want to do that in consultation and partnership with our provider. News 8. News 8, WTIC 1080 News. Hi, as far as vaccine distribution, is there anything specific you expect to change when the executive branch switches over next week? What will change that will be for the better? Uh, I'll start. Um, I think you're going to see a lot more clarity. Um, uh, I, I think there's going to be a better sense of what the priorities are in terms of those populations, a lot more clarity in terms of uh, the vaccinations or at least the um, doses as we get those vaccines, maybe be able to plan out a little bit further in advance. But I, I do think that over the last uh, couple of weeks, the coordination between the outgoing um, Pence COVID task force and the incoming Biden task force, uh, I think they're coordinating a lot better now. Dr. Gifford, as far as the transition, uh, you know, the the vaccination subgroup just changed phase 1B based on the CDC recommendation. Do you expect things to change radically starting next week so there will be more recommendations to cause you to switch? I, I don't at, at this point. I think um, uh, we'll continue to get information and, and further science from CDC and our HHS partners. Um, and uh, probably, as the governor mentioned, enhanced communication and collaboration. Um, but I don't uh, anticipate that there'll be um, further uh, changes to the phases at this point. We'll see. Uh, hard to say. Um, and I think there'll be news soon coming out of the new administration. But um, for right now, I think we sh we're planning to, to use the, uh, the allocation recommendations that we have. Fox 61. Hi, Governor. You mentioned congregate facilities. How would prisons be administered the vaccine? What's that process going to look like? Deidre or Josh, you want that one? Um, sure. Uh, so there, are, there is a healthcare team, obviously, that works with uh, our correctional facilities and. Um, then they um, may use additional partners to administer the vaccine um, as needed, uh, whether that's a contract or one of our uh, uh, provider partners uh, to come on site and administer the vaccination, similar to how we've done with testing uh, throughout the pandemic. The Associated Press. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Governor. Glad you're doing well. Um, I was wondering, um, there were discussions during the vaccine allocation subcommittee meeting about including 
uncompensated caregivers, um, people that might be a family member taking care of an elderly relative and including them in phase 1B. Under this latest plan, uh, where, do they, where do they stand? Deidre? Um, they are not uh, included in 1B, except to the extent that they fit in one of the other 1B categories. So if they have a chronic condition or if they're between the ages of 65 and 74, or if they're a frontline essential worker, they will eventually be phased into 1B. But other than that, as a standalone category, they're not included. And I was wondering also, how far out are these appointments being made and how quickly did they fill up today? What's the volume been like? Uh, so we're, uh, the day is still ongoing, so we'll have more and better information uh, at, by the end of the day. Um, we, we had booked um, a fairly small number so far, um, several dozen through the phone line when I checked in right before uh, this, uh, this uh, event. So, um, but there are a lot of people waiting in the queue. Um, so we'll know more at the end of the day as to how the scheduling is going. I will say that, um, you know, our, these provider partners that have been doing this have been doing large volumes of vaccine clinics um, all along since we started getting vaccine. They've been doing it um, uh, with the 1A uh, category. And we've had days when we've administered over 13,000 vaccines in a single day here in Connecticut. So um, these, these providers that are doing these high volume clinics, have, they've been doing this right along and um, they're scaling up. As the governor mentioned, we'll start having some mass vaccination sites in the coming weeks, uh, but they have been doing this right along and, um, and, and are you know, using the systems that they have in place. Yes, yeah, okay. so I'd only add that um, demand is far outstripping supply. As Deirdre said, we're working on the um, you know, mass vaccination sites. The first one will be Rensselaer Field, um, you know, Monday, Tuesday of next week. Uh, you'll be noticed if you have an appointment there. Of course, you can get a, a vaccine vaccinated there. You can also get tested there. And as needed, there'll also be a food support as well. So it's a triple play as needed. Oh, great. Thanks so much. Take care. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Hi, Governor. Glad to hear you're doing well. Um, so I actually had the experience of walking someone through VAMS earlier this week. And if you're not entirely familiar with computers, it can be a little difficult. Um, are these options, is it going to be somebody walking you through VAMS in, in any of these cases? Are they going to be asking you questions and then filling it in for you? Or, or how's this all going to work? You want that, Josh? Sure. So. Um, for people who register on the state uh, online portal, you're right, you, you will be uh, routed into VAMS. L like any new, um, you know, uh, application that someone's using for the first time, uh, it may not be perfectly intuitive where everything is, but we found that most people will find their way through there. But look, as the governor said, if, if, it's, if you're uh, not comfortable with that approach and you'd rather uh, call and speak to a human, uh, that person on the other end of that call line will actually step through and book the appointment for you while you're on the phone with them. Um, so that's the other option. And then a lot of the, our, our healthcare partners who are reaching out directly, that option one category, um, they all have uh, options to book online. And many of them also have call centers uh, for their own booking appointments as well. So there will be plenty of options for people depending on how comfortable you are with technology. Thanks. And then um, I know earlier this week, Fairfield put a survey up um, on its health department website. Um, how did that work with the rollout starting today? Were these health departments and hospitals contacted directly by the CDC or, or why was there sort of a soft launch, if you will, earlier in the week? Well, we had, we had said on Monday, if you recall, that any provider who's doing vaccinations, if they had open slots available this week, that they could go ahead and start filling them with people who are 75 and older. And so we were happy to see that uh, a number of providers uh, did get out in front of that this week. And we've had hundreds of people who are 75 and older already vaccinated. So that's a great head start uh, on this process. Um, and so we're, we're happy to see a couple of health departments. But look, in every town and every city, it's going to be a little bit of a different map of whether it's the hospital, the health department, a federally qualified health center, pharmacy. In most cases, it's going to be a, a, a mesh of, of all of the above as we uh, continue to ramp up and hopefully get more doses coming in from the federal government. Uh, thank you. And then one more uh, for people who are uh, maybe don't 
I have a home to go to or, or don't have access to a phone or computer, um, what's going to be the plan to reach out to them and, and try to get them vaccinated? So um, a, a number of our um, provider partners have uh, been working with uh, community-based agencies to um, reach those really hard to reach populations. Um, certainly, if you are somebody who knows an, a person over 75 that is in those circumstances, we encourage you to assist them either by helping them make a phone call or um, helping them uh, navigate the system. But um, uh, to the point I made earlier about the allocation subcommittee's uh, recommendations to the governor, we are very committed to making sure that individuals who um, don't have easy access to tech technology or don't have a medical home and provider can get a vaccine. So um, we are uh, uh, using the testing kind of machinery that we built, which was, which was really geared also at some of those most difficult reach populations were re, kind of re-engineering some of that um, uh, testing infrastructure to help us stand up vaccine infrastructure and we'll be using that what we those lessons learned to reach some of these hard to reach populations yeah i just amplify on that just like we learned with the testing um often the worried will come and, and come to you very easily or folks have a car for the drive-through but that leaves a lot of really important populations behind a lot of seniors who just can't get out. If you have a neighbor, look out for that neighbor. Otherwise, we do have the mobile vans, those um, vaccination vans that we go into churches and other houses of worship, doing everything we can to bring the vaccine to you if you can't come to the vaccine. Thank you all. Thanks, Peter. Connecticut Public Media. Good afternoon. Um, just reading what's on the state website as you try to sign up through for COVID vaccine that way, um, warning or urging people not to double book. Is this an issue you've run into? People are trying to get the vaccine so desperately that they're also booking through Hartford Healthcare and booking through the state website. Um, and you're gonna have these vacancies throughout the day that could have been filled with people who need the vaccine. Yeah, look, it, it's, it's something obviously we're we would prefer not to see. Uh, we definitely would ask people to just book one appointment. Um, we're all part of the community here, right? We're all trying to get through this together. And one of the ways that everyone can help is just to, once you have an appointment, stick with that. Um, and uh, and that'll just provide efficiency. But each of our providers, they, they do have instructions to always have a standby list as well. So that in the event that an appointment or two is canceled, that they have people to draw on so that at the end of the day, they're using every dose, every vial that's been opened. Um, we really have a very high importance placed on not wasting any doses. And Rensselaer Field and possibly, I believe you said, the Civic Center, XL Center being used as mass vaccination sites in the future. Any other areas of the state you're looking at and um, quote unquote venues that would be used? Yeah, the, the only other one that we're ready to announce publicly at this point, uh, you may have heard on Monday, Pat Charmel mentioned that there's going to be one in Shelton uh, operated by Derby Health, uh, by Derby Hospital. Um, we'll, we'll have, a uh, Griffin Hospital rather, in Derby. Um, we'll have um, uh, many more to announce, probably starting next week, um, that are in, uh, in uh, closing in on uh, final plans. But look, this the one thing for folks to keep in mind, though, is again, we're limited uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future by the number of doses we get in. And as Commissioner Gifford said, we, are, we already have the capacity set up to more than handle the weekly allocation that's kind of been forecasted to us for the next couple of weeks. So what we're doing is setting up these mass sites in anticipation that hopefully our allocations do increase, that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is approved. Um, we wanna make sure we're ready um, but at the current moment, you know, we'll have limited ability to really utilize those sites until the, the vaccines coming into the state increase. Hey, Josh, any timing on the neighborhood um, pharmacies? Yeah, so uh, on pharmacies, uh, you know, the, the two big chains, obviously, CVS and Walgreens have been extremely busy uh, vaccinating our long-term care facilities. Um, they've made tremendous progress and they're starting to work their way through that. And as they uh, free up capacity from those mobile teams that have been going out to nursing homes, um, we will start to see vaccination um, options uh, being set up at uh, retail pharmacy locations. I think Walgreens will be first in the, in the coming weeks. 
they had a, a smaller percentage of the assisted living facility and, and nursing home to do. So they'll have capacity sooner and then CVS will be falling behind them as well. And then also I should, for completeness, I should mention other community pharmacies and, and uh, independent pharmacies will also, many of them have also enrolled and will also have options there. The Connecticut Mirror. Governor, you mentioned that the vaccinations will reach congregate settings in the coming weeks. Are congregate settings considered uh, the next group after 75 and older uh, to go in phase 1B? And do you have a more precise timetable for that? Uh, I think I'm going to leave that to Deirdre. But it's worth remembering these congregate settings, um, not only are these people highly at risk in terms of um, not fatalities or uh, real complications, but also you've seen a flare-ups related to a lot of these as well. So that impacts the greater community. But where they are in the queue, Deirdre? Yeah, so you're exactly right, Governor. A lot of these, um, we, we have seen outbreaks in a number of these facilities. And so we do want to um, get their vaccinations going as soon as we can. This process is happening in parallel with the, with the public appointment process that we've been talking about. A number of the um, of provider partners, vaccinating, vaccinating partners that have been working with us on testing and um, are uh, working with us to set up, you know, these sort of mobile uh, clinics that the governor was talking about to go out to the congregate settings. So we're doing those in parallel um, and we're beginning to get those uh, uh, scheduled uh, soon. We, uh, those individuals obviously don't need to, to make a phone call uh, to get scheduled, right? The, the local health department or the state public health department will be coordinating that uh, vaccination in those congregate Thank you. The Hartford Current. Hey, everybody. This is Emily Brindley from The Current. Um, the first thing that I wanted to ask about is, you know, as other reporters have mentioned, and um, as has been reported a lot today, phase 1B is so big now that it really does seem like the stratification of the phases is the kind of critical point here. So can you, can somebody explain like what the, the timeline is or when the next group might be announced, what the next group might be? Because right now we're, we're kind of in a situation where we don't, at least as the public, don't really know what the next step is. Adrian? Yep. So um, what I can, what I can share with you, Emily, is the principles that um, I mentioned earlier about how we'll do the phase in. Um, and that is to look at um, risk of severe illness and death and to focus on issues of equity and health disparities. And then I, I'll point to kind of how we did the transition from 1A to 1B. Um, you, you might recall that originally we thought phase 1A was going to take us through most of January and that we wouldn't be starting 1B uh, until the month of February. Well, what we noticed is we started to see drop off in demand. And, uh, you know, the governor's direction to us has been no appointments left unfilled, no shots uh, left un ungiven. And so we, we quickly, you know, pivoted and started doing a phase 1B earlier than we thought. So we're focused now on individuals 75 and older because they're at very high risk for severe outcomes or death from COVID. As soon as we uh, start to see the demand from that uh, group uh, start to taper off, we'll start pivoting to uh, other groups within 1B. I realize there, that people want uh, details about when will I be next. And again, I'm gonna use that word patience and say that more details will uh, be forthcoming in, in the, in the you know, next days and weeks about when the rest of the group can be expected to start getting their appointments. So would you be able to give a timeline at least for when that information will be made public? I know you said the next days and weeks, but that could be a, you know, potentially a long period. So can you explain like when the state will be announcing each next group and, and also who is making those decisions or who is advising the governor on those decisions? So um, it's going to depend on uh, the uptake in the current groups and the number of doses that we get uh, from the federal government. Those are the variables that will um, that tell us when we can start moving through the next phases. And um, the recommendation from the allocation subcommittee to the governor was that the Department of Public Health work with the governor's office on um, rolling out phase 1B based on those principles that I described. 
Sorry, maybe I should have clarified my question more. I'm asking when the state will announce the next groups, even if those groups aren't going to start immediately. Because, um, you know, as you said, people are very anxious to see when they will be vaccinated. And because phase 1B is so large, it makes a significant difference what order those groups are in. So I guess I'm not clear on why the state can't decide now which group will be next, even if even if the state doesn't know when that group will start getting Yep. It's going to depend, Emily, on the uptake um, in each group, how many doses we get, and uh, and then we'll pivot to the next groups uh, as the demand slackens and the supply is available. I'm sorry, but when will the state announce which group is next? I'm not asking when the next group will actually start, but when will there be clarity on which group will be next in line? In the coming days and weeks. All right, thank you, everybody. And Governor, speedy recovery. Thank you, Emily. CT News Junkie. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks very much. Um, just real, uh, one real quick question to start off. Uh, Dr. Gifford, are we still working, or, or Josh, are we still the, is the working assumption still 60% uptake uh, in these uh, various vaccination groups? Um, so we've seen, that's what we've seen uh, um, in healthcare workers. Um, uh, we've seen higher uptake in our residents of long-term care facilities, closer to 70 to 80%. So we anticipate that the uptake is going to differ by population. As I think Josh or the governor mentioned, uh, we do anticipate that there'll be a fairly high rate of acceptance in people over the age of 75 and, and, and probably lower rates in uh, some of the younger age. Uh, how many people are assigned to work the appointment phone line? I don't have an answer to that question. We can certainly get that back to you. Uh, the announcement today said uh, providers may fill appointments for other uh, eligible phase 1B populations as spots become available. Um, how will that be determined? I guess that sort of goes to, uh, to, to Emily's previous question. But uh, if you're going to be allowing people to uh, take steps, so for example, would uh, 64 to 75 be uh, in line for that? Or would it be 16 to 74 with one of the uh, listed uh, medical conditions? Or or would it be one of the various categories of essential workers? So um, we're um, sending out further communication to uh, the uh, providers on this question. So it's, it's a really good question. Um, the main principle is, as I just said, um, every appointment slot should get filled and every vaccine, vaccine dose should be used. Um, and we are asking providers to reach out and really focus primarily on people 75 and older. If they are unable to fill their vaccine slots on a particular day with individuals 75 and older, um, then they um, uh, can move to uh, the other categories. Because we just got the recommendation yesterday um, around the, uh, the 65 and older and the under 65 with chronic conditions, we're still, still working through the logistics on that. So the next group, uh, because that, that recommendation has been out a little bit longer, that many of the providers will move to is the frontline essential. Um, could the, I guess, the reluctance of some of the phase 1A eligible um, essential workers, could, could that delay um, this process even more. I, I'm thinking that if, if people didn't go and, and get their shot at the at the first of the three clinics being offered at their uh, place of uh, employment, or um, then you know they're going to have to get number one and two in the in the last two, and I'm wondering if that could have any kind of ripple effect. I don't think so, Paul. I'll tell you why. Um, if you're in that first tier, um, you've got your reservation on the airplane and the last call for tier one. If uh, we haven't heard from you, then we go to the standby list. Those people who are 75 and above, but uh, there will be no seat unfilled. Every single vaccine is going to be utilized. 
And just, uh, I guess the, the, the last question would be, and it, it seems pretty obvious, but I just want to confirm, uh, following up on what Sue said about uncompensated caregivers, it looks uh, like they would be in 1C, correct? Well, it really depends on, um, you know, whether they're, if they're an essential worker, that right now the 1C is the essential workers that are not frontline essential workers and uh, non-healthcare workers. Um, if they're in the general population, then that's where they would be. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. And so, Governor, uh, hope you're feeling better. So. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Can you hear me? We got hey, you. Here. Okay, good. Uh, I think the first question is for Josh. Um, folks are reporting that everybody needs to have an email address in order to be entered into VAMS, even uh, individuals who are, who are making these appointments by phone a at some point must then create an email address in order to get logged into the system. Do, have we thought about, is that the case and can we change that? Because it seems to be a, a hassle for some uh, providers. Well, certainly for, for VAMS, it's true. You do need an email address to be able to receive appointment information and register in the system. Um, if you are helping a family member or a friend who does not have an email address, um, you can create one on Gmail in about two minutes. So you can certainly do that for them if, if you do want to book it online. As far as the phone support, um, uh, we can look into that. We do want to make sure we have options for people um, that, uh, that may not have that ability or may not have someone to help them. Okay. Uh, we said a few times here that, um, that folks should be making these appointments for themselves. They should not have uh, somebody else calling in and making the appointment for them. I, I guess I wonder how that would work for, for older folks, maybe folks with dementia, people who, who cannot uh, make appointments for themselves. Uh, how, how should they go about getting appointments? Yeah, no, I, I think the chart said that, you know, either for 75 or above, or if you're helping someone who's 75 and above, you're making an appointment for them. Um, that That's fine. We, we are okay with, you know, if you're helping a elderly relative or, or friend make that appointment. It's just if you're under 75 looking to book an appointment for yourself, that's what we're asking to please stay off the web state, stay off the phone lines. Okay. Uh, Governor, it's, it's good to see you uh, up and about. Um... It, it seems as if your uh, allocations committee has sort of taken a different route than the the path you have been um, advocating, which was sort of this idea that uh, if everybody's a priority, nobody's a priority. Uh, did you uh, give any thought to sort of overruling uh, this sort of wide net, uh, sort of vetoing it? No, but, but Hugh, um, your point is sort of well taken. In the last week, the CDC doubled the aperture, doubled the number of people that are now eligible. Like it's 1.4, I mean, you know, that's close to half of all the adults in this uh, state. So uh, they didn't really narrow the aperture much, but that's uh, Deirdre and Josh and the allocation committee are um, going to do that for us. Uh, we're not do that. We know who's in the 1B group, but now who gets phased in when? We've had several questions about that. Obviously, 75 and above are what, 100 and 250,000 or something. That's a lot of people. We've got a couple of weeks, three weeks to figure out who the next groups are going to be so we do this in an appropriate way. All right. Thanks, to everybody. The Day of New London. Hi. Glad to see you're doing okay, Governor. Um, Commissioner Gifford, um, I was just looking for a bit more information about as we go forward in Phase 1B, you know, you, you've talked about how uh, you know, there's going to be a prioritization of people who are the most at risk for severe illness and death and, and also looking at equity issues. How does DPH go kind of about fitting in those those ideals and those priorities into the groups we mentioned in terms of, you know, the 65 to 74 people with pre-existing conditions, um, uh, the frontline essential workers? You know, how is DPH going to to fit those kind of two things together, you, you know, what kind of data are you going to use for that? What metrics? So um, uh, the CDC has published a list. It's on their website of conditions that are associated with more severe outcomes of COVID. So we'll probably re rely primarily or exclusively on that list. It's backed up by data and um, CDC updates it as um, new uh, evidence becomes available. So we'll use um, their guidance for that. On the frontline essential workers, they've also provided a definition of who is um, of, of 
frontline worker and, and uh, essential worker categories have been established and we've used them for other uh, purposes uh, along the course of our reopening. So those are the, the, uh, the metrics that we'll use. We've also done a lot of um, work in uh, collaboration with our allocation subcommittee on looking at uh, race and ethnicity of some of these populations. So we know how they break down in Connecticut and, uh, and we've been looking at that data as well to use the so-called equity lens for uh, rolling out this next phase. I guess I, I understand the, the definitions of like within each of those groups, but I was looking at more, you know, how you're going to go about deciding, prioritizing kind of among those groups, you know, do, can you say now if you think that people with at least one pre-existing condition will be before the frontline essential workers or are they going to be kind of mixed together based on other factors? Yep, so uh, those are obviously all challenging questions to answer, given that we have more demand and we're gonna have supply. So, uh, you know, we'll be uh, continuing to look at the metrics that we just discussed. And um, I can tell you specifically right now an answer to the question about who will be phased in next. We'll be consulting with the governor's office, looking at those metrics and then providing further information. In the meantime, we understand and appreciate that people want to know when they'll be getting their vaccine. It's going to be a, a while, given you know the numbers the governor talked about, 46,000 doses on average that we're getting per week, 1.3 million people in phase 1B. It's going to um, take some patience for everybody to get rolled in. And one more thing, I, I don't know if you can kind of say based on just, you know, you were talking about the high volume of, of calls and web traffic you've seen today with people uh, over 75 signing up, um, both through the the phone system, through the state's web system, through other providers like Hartford Healthcare. Uh, you know, how far out are people booking, right? I, I guess, what are the options for how far out people can book and how far out are they booking? You know, do people have the option of picking? I'm sure everyone who is signing up wants to get it as soon as possible. But, you know, when they go, when they're on the phone or they're, they're on the website, is the option, you know, can they book out two weeks, a month, two months, three months? Um, I, you know what, I think we'll have more information for you on this uh, probably uh, tomorrow and Monday. Um, uh, the challenge we have here, of course, is that our, um, uh, we, we don't know exactly how much dosage we're going to be getting each week from the feds. Um, so uh, my hunch is that the uh, appointments aren't being, book being booked out too, too far in the future. But let us check in with our provider partners and get back to you on kind of what that's uh, shaping up uh, as after this first day. Thank you. Hey, I think that might be it. The um, world has certainly changed in the last, uh, you know, six weeks, hasn't it, Deirdre? I mean, at one point, you know, vaccine hesitancy, you can't make me get a vaccine. How we uh, convince people to do it? Um, the tone of these questions, the people on the phone, people trying to uh, access, uh, we understand that um, this is a state that's lost 6,500 people to COVID, and uh, we have the possibility of a... Uh, life-saving vaccine that seems to be working, seems to be safe and effective. Um, you know, so right now, um, Deirdre, you're earning your keep. I gotta tell you, as we um, figure out how we get the vaccine allocated in an appropriate way, and that's what we're trying to do. And, uh, you know, my priorities are A, um, uh, the greater public health, and then your individual health, and that impacts you, and that impacts uh, hospital utilization. I think those will be the key metrics as we go forward. And, um, you know, in the meantime, um, you know, please respect the process. It's easy to say be patient, but uh, when you have raging COVID and people feeling um, uh, nerves on edge, I know what people are feeling. But if you're over 75, it's 877-918-2224 or go to a CT gov COVID vaccine. Uh, it's gonna take a little bit longer, but we're gonna get there together. Hey, thank you guys.